when we looked at all the all of these autopsies had the same commonality. There was some nuance that no one understood. So that had to mean though, that had to mean that all of these smart people have absolutely no idea why customers do business with them. That was a tough thing to swallow. But guess what? We've been measuring it for eight years. It's totally true. Nobody knows. And all you can think is, did we just become best friends? Like that moment is irreplaceable. You can do that with, if you're selling plumbing parts, you can do that to the person across the table from you if you have the right information. So part of our job is find that information. All right, good morning, good crowd today. Everyone wants to hear the incredible Grant Gooding and his stories of his life's journey. So uh, this has been exciting. I'm looking forward to it. I know a lot of folks on here are. So Grant, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, your story and all you do and what's led you to, uh, to this role as, uh, as founder at, at Proof Positioning and some of the things you do to have an impact on the business community. Uh, thanks, Randy. Uh, what's up, everybody? I, I think it could be best described as a series of strategically and, and surgically perfect executed uh, events that were well thought out. Or the complete and absolute opposite of that, which is more, which is the journey is a little bit more equatable to a drunk falling backwards and hitting his head and coming up with an idea. That's that's probably the closest description. Uh, I, um, I've never known what I wanted to do uh, because my brain jumps around to problems and, and likes figuring things out and then gets bored quickly and moves on. Uh, I was a music major, um, was very fortunate. Um, I had a, a, um, a friend of mine that told me I could sing when I was in high school and I didn't know I could sing. She said, you can sing. And uh, so I tried out for the choir and I made the choir and then I made the concert choir and then I made the chamber choir and then I made traveling choirs and I got to sing in nine different countries in Europe and Carnegie Hall and um, uh, got scholarships to go sing under Dr. Brown at William Jewell where we traveled the country and um, I was good at it, but I didn't necessarily like it. I don't think there's a lot of people that are like that. You tend to stick with things you happen to be good at, even if you don't enjoy it. But what I found myself doing, particularly in European travels, was finding ways to provide value to the other attendees and even the orchestras and finding out ways to make money off of them by finding value in things they didn't have. So... I always kind of had this entrepreneurial bug, but didn't really know what to do with it. Um, accidentally started a company when I was in college, um, my freshman year, into my freshman year, that worked. Um, we went to old types of businesses like manufacturing, and we upgraded their their 8-bit DOS operating systems to NTFS. I mean, I didn't know anything about that stuff, but I had two really smart um kids in the dorm next to me that that was their major. So I basically just paid them a third of what I could charge to get stuff done and just made up the rest. Uh, um, and that worked and we built a company and we hired kids out of DeVry and, and then I opened two offices and had no idea what I was doing and totally ran into the ground. And during all this, I completely forgot to go to class so William Jewell very politely asked me to leave, um, which I obliged because I had no choice. <laughs> and I ran the company. I tried to start another company and it, it wasn't working the way I should. And I had a, a very successful uh, businessman who had was it a big account that I was trying to get. And he said, granted, and I was probably, I don't think I was even old enough to drink. Yeah, maybe I was, maybe I was 21. And he said, I think you're a smart kid and I think you can accomplish these things, but you weren't even able to finish college and I'm not 100% sure that you're gonna stick with me. 
which is a completely lucrative point as I look back now. <laughs> At the time, I thought it was wildly unfair. And I said, you know what? I'm going to go finish college. So I, I was like, what am I going to do? Well, I live here. I was still wasn't sure what I'm going to do. So I went to UMKC and, and, I, and I went in and I said, I'm going to finish my degree. Here's where I started. And they said, no problem. Send over your transcripts. And I said, okay. And I remember I, I, my freshman year, I tried very hard. I, I, I went to class and, and, and then after that kind of fell off the table, but and I lost all my scholarships and everything else. And the, uh, <laughs> the lady uh, at the admissions office said, uh, you can't go to school here. And I said, oh no, why, like, why not? Well, we got your transcripts and you have an accumulative GPA of 0 0.50 and she was rounding up. And, uh, and I was like, oh, well, that's okay. And she said, no, that's not okay. And it never occurred to me that like, oh yeah, you have to have good grades to get into college, <laughs> even if you're going back. And so I didn't know what to do. So I went to community college and I took six classes, like biology, calculus, all the stuff I didn't like and uh, got straight A's and then took it back and said, now will you let me go? And they said, yeah. So I finished, went through my MBA, decided I would be a lawyer. So um, worked in law firms, um, doing analysis, and then after working in, and then the one got my MBA, and while I was doing that, I realized uh, working in law, being a lawyer sucks. Like, I don't want to be a lawyer. Uh, my family's full of lawyers. And um, I was like, I'm not doing this. So I'm back to not knowing what I'm going to do. So um, but my, my, my dad said, you're pretty good at this business analyst stuff. Why don't you, why don't you go do that? So he put me in touch with some of his friends and I did analysis um, and I was pretty good at it. Looking at businesses and figuring out why they tick and do, trying to figure out like um, the logistics around them, the finance around them, uh, went and got a, a, a expert accreditation in valuation. So then I valued a few companies as an expert witness, which is a nightmare. Actually, it's a nightmare unless you are the attorney who is deposing me because I'm a 26 year old who yes, has degrees and an expert accreditation and I'm the expert witness and I'm in my mid twenties. And he's like, when's your boss going to get here? And I'm like, I am, I am the expert witness. And they're like, Oh, and I didn't get anything for you. Um, but that is a nightmare and I hated it, but it really helped me understand business in a, in a wildly finite um, and uh, as far as the, the, the hard numbers of business. And still, uh, and anyway, so I, I worked uh, for that company doing major acquisitions. So transportation, construction, big, big deals. And and then I had, I met this guy and had this offer to come work and do small market stuff, which I thought sounded like a lot more fun. Uh, like small manufacturing, small distribution, even retail, much higher volume, lower dollars. That's where I met Courtney actually. Courtney was the um, director of operations for that firm we had. Well, she'll know, she'd know better than me, but maybe 30 principals around the country, probably ex CEOs and ex CFOs. Um, and of course we were the only ones that were even similar, like even close in age. So I would say like we hung out, not because I liked her because I didn't want to just talk to old people the whole time. And um, we, I really loved that. I loved the people, the analysis I, every day is like my 10 o'clock was you know, a second generation uh, owner who took over his, his, you know, parents manufacturing company and you get to hear everything that goes wrong and how they fixed it and why they're great and all these things. And, and then you get to do it again, two other times in the day. It's like, I called it, I called the experience an MBA every day because being able to be exposed to that volume of business wisdom all the time. I, I, I was absolutely, I mean, I'd do it for free. Um, and then the real estate market collapse hit, right? So Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac explode. The new regulations that were put on banks made small market acquisitions almost impossible. 
one thing in particular was the that was the writing on the wall for me was you had to have a 30 percent carry back so everybody here uh who has their own company imagine you decide you want to sell it and you got a 10 million dollar asking price the requirement at the time was that you had to hold back three million dollars as a personal loan against the buyer who the hell's going to do that nobody's going to do that so we kind of said all right well um the federal government without realizing it just destroyed small market acquisitions for the foreseeable future i gotta figure something else out well during this time one of the things that i uh realized and it really didn't uh it really didn't hit me until it happened to someone that was more of a friend who like we helped um he took a package from sprint had a bunch of money and said hey i can't really repeat this inflated salary i need to buy something so he looked at lots of different companies and put them in something he was comfortable with and he uh wildly capable super smart guy uh ran a very simplistic salon model into the ground in 18 months and i'm like how in the hell is that possible there is no way that a salon model can get away with someone that this has this level of intellect and business experience, who knows how to run teams, is smart at logistics and operations and sales. That simply does not make sense to me in a, in a matter of time that God would appreciate. I mean, that level of wealth destruction was pretty remarkable. So we started looking into this and this was kind of like something that's whispered around in the halls, right? These failure rates. So started actually doing analysis on these failure rates and, and the numbers are horrifying. Um, if you buy a business, if say you're, you're a manufacturing company that manufactures coffee mugs and you buy another coffee mug manufacturing company, the exact same business, there's only a 30% chance that inside three years, the business that you bought will be solvent. How in the hell is that possible? It's not as though it's a completely foreign business model. So we start looking at these and looking at these, these kind of, we call them autopsies. Um, why do these failure rates exist? What's being missed? There's a hell of a lot of smart people that are looking at these things. You've got, you've got financial strategists and accountants and brokers and lawyers, and they're breaking this thing down. I mean, they are dissecting these businesses. Now, sure, many of them are, um, uh, if they're done correctly, uh, years before the actual transaction, they're being set up, right? Like we are minimizing expenses and we're maximizing revenue, i.e. maybe we aren't doing the types of maintenance on machines and things that we otherwise would because we want to basically drop those expenses to the bottom line and pad the book so that we get a higher multiple. Makes total sense. Or a higher multiple, you get a higher return, right? Um, but but for a failure rate of 70% of some of the smart, these are the smartest people we have, people that run businesses. These are intuitive, intellectual people. And how the hell do you explain that failure rate? It just didn't make any sense. So um, I started looking at what was being measured in due diligence. Well, it's like almost any business. You're measuring hard quant. You're measuring dollars. You're, you're buying a PL, a balance sheet, an inventory list, and a customer list. That's what you're buying. And, and what are the what are the characteristics of those things that you're buying? Like what are the what are the data points that are going to make you confident in, in this is a good fit? You get to see customer turnover rates. You get to see upsell capability. Now, if you're smart, the reason you bought coffee, cup, coffee uh, mug company number two is because you go, oh my gosh, we have this new line of coffee mugs that these guys don't have. We have totally different customers. Now we just basically bought a, a whole different uh, customer list that we can now remarket to without, uh, by eliminating a competitor in the market, maybe achieving some type of supply chain advantage. Um, uh, 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 and, and so you look at this and, and most acquisitions are looked at as a one plus one equals three. And, and, and all the analysis that's done in these, you're really just measuring what we determine to be five things. It's who, what, when, where, and how. Who are our customers? What are they doing? When are they doing it? How are they doing it? And, 
And, and that, that type of information is all essentially quant. So think about your own organization. That's stuff that you're probably knee deep in all the time. Who, what, when, where, how. Think about the analytics on your website, for instance, a very good, very easy way to think about it. You can see who's on for the most part. You can see what they're doing. You can see the pages they're going from page A to page B. You can see when they're on. You can see how they got there, what they typed in, where they came from. So here's a fundamental question. Why are they there? Why did the, why did the customers exist in coffee, cup, in coffee cup company B? Was it the same reason that their customers were there in coffee cup company A? And after a lot of analysis and overthinking, uh, that was actually the answer. When we looked at all the, all of these autopsies had the same commonality. There was some nuance that no one understood. So that had to mean though, that had to mean that all of these smart people have absolutely no idea why customers do business with them. That was a tough thing to swallow. But guess what? We've been measuring it for eight years. It's totally true. Nobody knows. We think we do. Do you know why? Because we're smart and we're biased and we understand our business. We know that we use a special acrylic coating on our coffee mugs that make them last forever. We have absolutely no idea. It's a hypothesis. We have absolutely no idea if that's why people buy. Go ask your friend or neighbor or ask yourself, even though when you ask yourself, you're gonna, you're gonna answer it because of how your brain works. Why do people do business with you? Well, they trust us. Is that right? That's never happened. We measure this objectively with the quant qual method. Trust has never come up one time in over 400 studies as a reason that someone does business with somebody else. Trust is a cop-out manifestation of other things. Trust is an ethos. It's nothing that you can put your finger on. And if you can't put your finger on it, you can't build it and you can't measure it. So I figured, what if we built a model, some type of a way that we could figure this out? And then that way I could take that knowledge to a due diligence process for a transaction. And I can say, don't buy this company. Even though it looks really, really good on paper, there are the reasons that people buy from you and the reasons they buy from them are totally different which means you have to change your culture. Everything you understand about why your business runs correctly needs to change. And that's essentially why these failures happen. So we tried to build a tool. Um, it was extremely rudimentary and embarrassing um, when, when we look back on it. Uh, but we've essentially, uh, uh, Today, we've kind of perfected. So here's what happened. We, we built this model and we said, all right, this is gonna be a company. And we did it a few times. It did not work, by the way, it did not work in the mergers and acquisitions market. It was a huge failure. And the reason is because the seller's attorneys wouldn't let us anywhere near their customers, which is absolutely fair. Because imagine you've been, you've been cooking your books you know, to, you know, not, you know what I mean, right? You've been painting your books in a positive light for years. You have this company, you've worked very hard to put a, a to put a box and a bow on it. And now we're going to let some weirdo in to go analyze your customers. Absolutely not. We're jeopardizing their valuation. So they shouldn't let us anywhere near, um, anywhere near their customers. So it was a complete failure. But what we did find out is that when we had these conversations with buyers in particular, they would, and then they went through the transaction, they, they would call us six months later and they would say, hey, can you still do that thing? Like we've had some issues and we need to try and get them figured out. And so that was really the, the, that was really the aha moment that was like, oh, this doesn't work in the mergers and acquisitions market. It works just normally. Um, another like, duh, okay. Um, so, we, uh, we, started, we started building this company 
in, in, in using this model. And then what would happen is, is a client would say, hey, you know more about our customers than we do. Um, we have like a half a million dollar annual uh, budget for advertising. Would you guys take that? It seems like you know what to say and who to say it to. Can you put together advertising campaigns and spend our money for us? And I was like, oh, that's a really good idea. That, yeah, we could do that. So we bought a, a small advertising company and acquired their clients and assets and people and started doing that. And we grew pretty fast. Um, and after oof, five years, four years, four years or five, Courtney knows this information. I, I don't <clears throat> say four or five years. Um, we were like, this sucks. We had, uh, it's low margin. Being an agency is not fun. It's not, I don't know anything about it. We, it's not good. Uh, so I asked Courtney one day, I said, who's our, uh, who are our best clients? And she didn't even hesitate. She said our research clients. So there's some clients who just hired us to do research. And then there were some that hired us to do agency work. Well, we gave away this extremely valuable piece of research in order to get the annual spend, which made a lot of sense. Um, so I joined HIMP. Uh, if you don't know, HC, our friend HC is a, a mentor there, and um, uh, but it's a phenomenal program. And I sat down, and my mentor's name is, is a woman named Margaret Reynolds, who is one of the best kept secrets in this city. She is absolutely brilliant. And uh, she said, on the very first time we ever met, she sat down, she's like, I looked at your business model. Why aren't you doing this? Why are you doing that? Why are you doing this? And I'm sure I had very intelligent reasons as to the answers, but fundamentally, her, her biggest feedback was, you have one thing that's special that no one else has and you're giving it away for free in order to capture low margin revenue. And I'm sure my response is probably like, well, that's your opinion. But she was totally right. And so we literally like shut the company down and started over. And that was in like 2017 or something. Um, took on a ton of debt and said, we're a research company and this is what we're gonna do. And we're going to use this process and we're going to grow it. And it was absolutely, she was totally right. It was absolutely the right call. We totally rebuilt the company and um, had to change, had to change damn near everything. We only, I only kept our core, our core crew that we needed and, um, you know, downsized and everything else. And um, now what we have is uh, an extreme, since fo there's something to be said about focus, by the way. When you don't have to worry about doing media buying and social media and uh, digital and all the other creative and all the other things you're supposed to be great at as an agency and you focus on one thing, you tend to kick ass at that thing very quickly. And that's what we did. We put everything into that one thing and man, not only did we get really damn good at it, we got really, really efficient at it. Um, our margins went from 50 to 81% in two years, just with through efficiencies and software focus. And we were able to increase our prices because we were better at it. We were, and we were fast. We were faster than anybody else that tried to even do um, half what we could do. And, um, uh, and it's, and we continue and we continue to grow and it's been a, it's been a fun ride. Um, we grew 70% last year, we grew 100% the year before. And so since we reset, um, it's, um, we're having just a, we're just having a blast. Do you wanna know how we do it? Most people wanna know this, even though it's nerdy. All right, here's how we, here's, here's why our thing is special. So because there's almost any organization that can uh, analyze and figure out big data. Again, who, what, when, where, how. Imagine you're a coffee shop. All right, I'll give us an example, right? They're going to be able to measure how many people walk in, what they buy, when they buy it. So you can reverse engineer that information and be super efficient at inventory, ordering, when we can send two employees home, uh, making sure that you have minimizing waste and rework on, on, on your prep kitchen, right? And, and all, those th all, of, all of that analysis is wildly important to operating an efficient, profitable business. But again, why did anyone 
one person or in the aggregate, why are people coming into our coffee shop? We have absolutely no idea. There's no way to figure that out based on their behavioral data. It's not difficult or tricky, it's impossible. You cannot look at the aggregate of someone's movements and ascertain why they did it. You can only create hypotheses. So our job is to help organizations figure out those hypotheses and then we figured out a way to test them. So that was tricky too, because how do you figure out the motivations behind someone? So I very much believe in, um, in looking to nature to find answers. Nature has been solving problems a hell of a lot longer than we have. And it seems like every time we try to outsmart nature, they make, them, they make us look stupid. And there are case studies and case studies and case studies about how we've done this in medicine and engineering throughout, uh, throughout uh, you know, the existence of humans. And I couldn't find a single example. Not freaking one. So um, we turned to neuroscience and behavioral economics. So what we what we do is um, oh by the way I just want to really quick into that. So one of the things I want to bring it to our attention this thing about our coffee shop as a leader, right? Which I think everybody in here is a leader. Your job is to figure out why, who, what, when, where, how. That's the job of a manager. That's the job of a manager aggregating information to put in someone into a leader's hands because who what when where how is worthless information when you when you put into consideration why if you understand why things happen everything in your organization becomes easy if you know why people are coming in you can increase it if you know uh why they're not coming in you can figure out a way to change it but if you're only looking at the behavior there's a million correct and incorrect pathways that you can take. So consider that your organization. Most people, when I say that uh, to clients anyway, I'm like, what are you using to try and figure out why? And most people don't have any processes in place, but that is your job. Uh, it's the hardest job. That's why it's your job. Otherwise you just hand it off to a manager to figure out. So, um, uh, so anyway, so here's what we do because we had to, we had to, because we needed to understand how people are going to resonate. There are a whole series of problems we needed to understand in order to get in somebody's head. Um, we, use a, we use a survey methodology, digital surveys. Nobody, nobody seems impressed. No one's impressed? Yeah, um, it's, not, it's not the sexiest medium, but it's extremely effective, it's efficient, it's cheap, it's fast, and everybody already knows what it is, which is a huge advantage. It's not a challenge for us to get people to take a survey. But when they're in there, that's when we went and started studying and looking at surveys. And to put it bluntly, very rarely, maybe one in a hundred survey, because we look at surveys and things that clients do and agencies do. If I find, I bet one out of a hundred surveys I would give on a scale of one to 10, as far as quality uh, above a three. Most are abysmal. And it's not because people are stupid, it's because there's no such thing as survey school, right? There's like, there's not a whole lot of best practices around doing, it's very, very basic. It's, well, don't ask somebody to, you know, don't ask somebody a double negative because it'll confuse them. Um, but, but most of them are wildly biased where they're clearly trying, they're trying to justify something that's already in their head or the agency is clearly trying to sell something that they already hoped that they were gonna be able to get out of the client. So we had to figure out how do you write a good survey? Um, and there's not, there's not a lot of resources for that. Um, and, and then we also had to figure out how to tap through different parts of, of the brain. Here's why. According to Dr. Antonio Damasio, who has, been, who has been studying consciousness and how the brain operates for 20 years at, at USC. Now he's a world famous neuroscientist because of his work. He, he stumbled backwards, as similar to my journey, into the biggest finding of his life, which is that the smart part of our brain, the, the frontal lobe, which is the least developed, right? Because the brain develops in a human being from the back forward. Reptilian brain, this is me need food, me need fire to the mammalian brain, which is uh, emotions where our pituitary glands release 
uh, dopamine and norepinephrine and serotonin into our body to create strong emotions. Uh, and also how we socially communicate to our smart brain, which is our frontal lobe, which essentially is in charge of doing mathematics and complex problem solving. So what happened was he was doing a study on um, uh, patients that had had certain parts of the limbic system of their brain, their mammalian brain damaged through head trauma and things like that. And so what he discovered was that they were almost completely unable to make a basic decision. And it manifested itself one day when the Institute forgot to bring breakfast down. And they always had the same like six options for breakfast, you know, like bagel, cereal, you know, whatever. And so he passed a clipboard around and he said, write down your name down and what you want and we'll make sure and bring it down and, and we'll have, you know, uh, uh, you know, the team bring it down. And the clipboard was not moving. And he's like, what's going on? So he grabbed a clipboard and he started talking to him about it. And what followed, he quoted as endless logical deliberation, which I can only imagine is, well, I had a banana yesterday. Should I have a banana today? One time I read an article that said I should eat oatmeal every day because a lady that ate oatmeal every day lived to 120. And these people, imagine this, how they, 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 they uh, are robots. They don't know how to react to things. Their happiness, sadness, fear, anxiety, these things don't exist to them. And, uh, but, but, the, but the most significant output of that was that they couldn't make a, bit, make a damn basic decision about what to eat for breakfast. And uh, he said, some people would come up to him later and be like, I should have gotten the oatmeal. I should have gotten the oatmeal. I think I should have gotten the oatmeal. And so he spent, he spent the rest of his career studying uh, this phenomenon. So it turns out he was right. We've always believed um, at, at, in our species that we use the logic centers and the emotive centers of our brain contextually together to solve problems because we're such a smart species. In actuality, we don't, we don't use the smart part of our brain that allows us to do engineering and build bridges and, and, and clean water. We don't even use that part. The same part of your brain that you use to pick a job, pick a mate, uh, buy a house, it's the same part of your brain that you use when you're trying to figure out what to put on your sandwich at Subway. That's real. So if that's the case, we had to figure out a way to isolate that. Because, and any good salesperson knows, if you talk about logic, you lose. The more you talk about logic in a sales conversation, the less money you make. And that's real. Physiologically, that's real, right? That's like a thing that good salesmen know. For instance, if you're a crappy salesperson that's trying to sell you a car, will be like, you know, this has 304 horsepower, right? It has a six speed transmission, four wheel drive, feature, 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 feature. A good salesperson will say, how fast you need this son bitch to go? That's the right question. How safe does your family need to be in this vehicle? They're going to close that deal just based on that one first question, because they're, they're, they're reading the human and they're, they're, they're injecting emotion into their brain. Now, once, once as Johns Hopkins says, once the human brain has, uh, they will decide, uh, they will decide uh, on a decision, their emotive brain will, in 200 milliseconds. Once that has sat in their brain for 400 milliseconds, it's damn near impossible to change. We are such a sophisticated, fancy species. Isn't that ridiculous? So once you set that hook and you make that strong emotional appeal, baby, it's over. So part of our job is to figure out what is the right emotional appeal to say to whom? Because there's a million correct answers, right? Because uh, your customers are classified in different ways. How many segments of customers do you have? Um, what you can say different things to all of them. A good salesperson uses their intuition to read and use Socratic method. I'm gonna ask as many questions as I can to learn about this person so I don't screw it up. A really magical moment in sales is serendipity. So imagine that you have this, uh, imagine you have this like embarrassing show that you like, like everybody has one. So call it the great British 
Bake Off. It's probably not a real show, but you know what I mean? So imagine you're having coffee with a random person and your introductory coffee back when you're back when you were actually allowed to meet people, right? So you're Zooming with them or you're actually having coffee or whatever. And the person across from you says, um, oh my gosh, sorry. Uh, I had to throw myself together this morning quickly because I was up super late and uh, uh, because I was watching, like I was binge watching The Great British Bake Off. And all you can think is, did we just become best friends? Like that moment is irreplaceable. You can do that with, if you're selling plumbing parts, you can do that to the person across the table from you if you have the right information. So part of our job is to find that information. So what we had to do is we had to figure out when information goes into the logic brain. So how the hell do you figure that out? Well, um, actually it's timing. So if you're not familiar with Daniel Kahneman's work, Daniel Kahneman won the Nobel Prize in 2002 in behavioral economics. And that dude is smart. And he started the whole wave of behavioral econ, which we at Proof are like wildly obsessed with and nerd out about way too much. Um, and uh, Daniel Kahneman says that um, the speed at which the systems of the brain work are critical, right? Johns Hopkins has a lot of data to back this up as well. But he says there's system one and system two. System one is your quick brain, which is your emotive brain. System two is your slow brain. So if we know this, then we know that um, if someone has to think about an answer for a long time, that means it's rattling around and it's moving from the limbic system of the brain into the frontal lobe, which means we have just made, we've forced them to use logic. And if you force someone to use logic, you lose the sale. So we need to be able to measure when that happens. And when that does happen, we have to be able to, um, uh, A, we have to be able to identify it so that we can like sort of eliminate that thing or decrease its value. So we figured it out. So we use a timing mechanism. We measure people's behaviors when they read and how they answer things. And we do it in milliseconds, which was actually a complete coincidence because we built that before we knew, before Johns Hopkins research came out about milliseconds. So that was pretty fortunate. But with computers, we can actually do that. So for instance, we'll ask someone how old they are and then we'll measure how quick they respond. And that serves as a baseline. And we draw a bell curve around the speed that they, that they made that answer. Then we'll ask them something like, um, we'll, we'll give them a concept, right? And the concept, there's a whole thing I won't get into around how you have to actually translate your value propositions. Because most value propositions of organizations are lit, they're laden with creative language, which the brain actually does not like. The brain does not like creative flowery language. I don't care what your expository writing teacher told you in high school. It wants to be able to categorize and classify a piece of information inside of our head. And if it can do that, then it will, then it, you will remember it for almost ever, right? There's a fun little test I do for people. You don't have to take everybody off mute, Randy. But like, uh, uh, if I say affordable airline or expensive coffee, or greeting card, the same three brands just popped into everybody's head. There's probably not one exception. That is because they were able to insert an idea inside of our brain. And once it's there, says Johns Hopkins, it ain't going anywhere. Like for instance, Southwest hasn't been the most affordable airline for over a decade, but you still thought it. So if you can find a way to inject yourself and your company inside someone's head in an emotional, memorable way that uses objectivity, it's almost impossible for them to forget it. It's a total way to use psychology to cheat in, in when you're using sales and marketing. So anyway, um, uh, so what we did is we, we, we draw a bell curve around how fast people answer questions. Then we use that measurement when we, when we analyze concepts. So we might say, um, uh, uh, if we're doing, if we're, if we're testing for a plumbing parts company, we'll say can deliver, uh, any volume of order inside two days. And then we'll measure how they respond to that. 
Now it makes it sound, it sounds weird to say, well, somebody's not going to be emotional around delivery time. The hell, yes, it isn't because you're talking about their supply chain. You're talking about their business. Uh, we see really, really high emotive scores around B2B because a lot of times it's a very fragile system. And if I lose a vendor who surprised me a certain raw material or a part that I need to, to assemble to get to the finish line, that's a big damn deal. I got to go source somebody else. Imagine the, 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 uh, 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 the, all the um, orders you're not going to be able to fulfill because you can't assemble a part and ship it. So anyway, um, uh, we measure the emotional resonance that they have around those ideas and then we put them on a scale of relativity. So we're able to come back to an organization and say, okay, look, um, and there's a few other fancy things I won't go into about like how we use Likert scales and we use conjoint in different ways and things like that. Um, but what we're able to do is provide a number, give a number to an idea. So like uh, being able to deliver uh, in two days has an, it has an emotional resonance score. That's our, that's our secret sauce. We have this scale that doesn't exist anywhere else. And it's a scale between zero and 100. And that's a 71. And then uh, we'll test another about 20 things in any given time. So imagine coming up with 20 different value propositions as to why people buy from you. It sounds like a lot. It's not a lot. <laughs> if you write down what those things are, it can be a personal relationship with the account manager, right? We would push you to make that a little bit more objective. It could be the fact that you've been in business for X, Y, Z. The fact that you have a ordering system that only takes two minutes. Uh, all those things are reasons that people buy. And one of the things that we found, by the way, when we were doing all those autopsies years ago on, on those business, on those transaction failures, the reasons that people bought were little tiny things like that. Um, one of the greatest examples we had was a two distribution companies. One distribution company A bought distribution company B and they eliminated their customer service department. Well, there was an old lady that was in, uh, they only had four people in there, it was small, and there was an old lady in there that nobody liked. And I've given her the name Betsy, uh, even though I don't actually know her, name, her real name. Um, but uh, Betsy had been there longer than the CEO of, the, of that company that was acquired. She had, she was the one, a $60,000 salary, had all of the relationships with their biggest customers. So they went, oh, nice, fancy, uh, uh, you know, four-person call center you have here. We have sophisticated metrics. We have, we have all these training things around. We have a way better customer service department. So when they acquired the company, they eliminated that customer service department. And without realizing it, eliminated the company's competitive advantage. So company B, they lost their biggest customer six months, 12 months, they lost their third biggest customer. And next thing you know, that entity was upside down inside two years. So they're paying debt service on a company that's losing money, even though they were able to, uh, to find all these efficiencies, like the money they saved on eliminating the customer service department. What's the probability that that CEO knew the importance of Betsy? Let, let's say that he was humble enough and it was a he. Let's say, that, let's say that he was humble enough to know. What's he supposed to do with that information? Because if I'm the one that's buying company B, I'm going to go, the hell with this crap. I'm going to go offer Betsy $120,000 salary and bring her on my team. Why, why spend millions of dollars buying a company when I can buy a person? Very, very tricky business. So um, anyway, that's what we do all day. We, we look for what we call burning questions. Organizations say, hey, look, um, we released this product. Our customers told us to build it. They're not buying the damn thing. What, what's wrong? Did we over-engineer it or under-engineer it? Are we selling it wrong? Are we pricing it wrong? There's any number of reasons. Well, what's the way? The way is guess and check. The way is let's increase the price, let's decrease the price. The way is qual, which is what my formal MBA was in, qualitative analysis. Um, which, I'm, which we don't use, should tell you something about the effectiveness of qual and conversations, right? That social brain plays way too much of a role. Because if I'm talking to Harry Campbell, I know that I, if I talk about sports, I'm going to release dopamine into his head. Because he's a humongous sports nut. 
And I know there are trigger points with Harry. Like if I say the word Hoosiers, he's going to freak out, right? And if I talk about the chair throw, there's going to be a whole bunch of memories that come rushing back into his head because he was there. And it was a really important part of his life. So um, I'm immediately biased in my conversation when I'm talking to Harry because I know there are some things that he wants to hear. And we are pleasers. So if you go and ask your best customer, hey, why are you doing business with us? He's going to tell you what you want to hear. He's not going to tell you the real reason. It's not because he wants to lie to you. It's because his brain can't help it. So we figured out a way to cheat and use math to help make sure that we're getting true, honest answers. No one can lie to us because we don't ask them direct questions like that. Um, that's what we do all day. I, Randy, I hope that's what you want to know because that's what I talked about. I want about eight more hours. I hope you blocked off the day. <laughs> <laughs> I have like a, a million questions. <laughs> but we do have some other questions. Michelle, do you want to, uh, you want to go? Mute myself. Hey, Grant, I love your presentation. Fascinating information. And it's making me think about all the years I've used client testimonials. My past company, we did it with our marketing groups. We'd always gain this information, put them on the website, show them to clients. And I just am so curious to see, did you see any parallels between client testimonials that some of your clients had and then all the research that you did? Or did they just mean nothing? I'm just so curious to see if you saw any of that co coincide or are people just saying the nice things, kind of like when you have references for yourself and you only send the ones that people, you know, are going to talk nicely about you. I'm just curious if you saw any of those things being yeah. related or not. So testimonials are wildly biased. Um, <clears throat> we, and, and I have, I have a, a number in my head of the number of testimonials that I think are actually uh, sincere. And that's 70%. I think that 30% of testimonials are written by the client and approved by the, uh, approved by the person that wrote them. And, uh, which is fine. Um, but I, I would say looking at the type of data that we get back and the correlation that exists to testimonials is not going to be accurate at all. That's not to say, however, that they aren't effective. We use testimonials. Why? Because, well, mostly because we do something real weird. And we're selling this very strange thing that you kind of have to take a little bit of a leap, leap of faith to do. And seeing that other people do it releases good juju chemicals in our brain. And that, uh, and you know why? Here's why. Um, we are pack animals. It, you know, it, 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 we are dogs, not cats. We uh, fundamentally, your brain, your brain's job is to keep you alive. That's it. Well, wait a minute. It's not to be to like solve problems and like create beauty. No, it doesn't care. Your brain's job is to keep you alive. And it's the same filter. Your brain runs through that filter all the time. It's like insultingly dumb, dumb. And your brain knows that the more uh, homogeny that exists, the, the, the more comfortable you are because your brain knows strength in numbers. So anytime you can create the idea of everybody's doing it, everybody's doing it as a thing. It releases comfort. If you are by yourself, so I have this like kind of like pseudo like TED talk thing that I'll do that I'll, I'll annotate. Um, gazelles run in packs, right? Lions know when to attack a gazelle because it does what? Separates from the pack. Whether it's sick, it took a wrong turn, it sneezed, it's slow, whatever, the lion goes after that individual because it knows mathematically in its DNA that if it, if it goes after the isolated gazelle, it has a mathematically higher probability of getting a meal. Your brain also understands this relationship. Here's the irony. In business, it's the exact opposite. If you stay with the pack, you go away. You don't become noticeable. You become boring. And your brain is genetically predisposed to find things that are different. Is it because it's interested? No, it's because it could potentially be a threat. So all of your senses 
are, are designed to find things that are different in a landscape. I call it a, oh crap, is that a lion instinct? Because that's kind of what it is. It's looking for grass, 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 lion, oh crap, and a lion can kill you. And that's why it looks to find things different. So on one hand, you have your brain saying, for the love of God, don't do anything different or you'll die. And on the other hand, it's saying, if you don't do anything different, no one will see you. And that's the real, that's the real issue. The real dichotomy that exists in marketing and communication is that your brain is actually having an internal battle. And if you do something different, if you separate from the pack, your brain releases a chemical called norepinephrine. If you guys have ever released a product or started a new job, you don't sleep the night before because that norepinephrine is creating anxiety in your spine. Not a good. It's uncomfortable. Your brain says, do the same thing. Your brain absolutely loves status quo. Here's what you have to remember. Be the gazelle. And here's why. People follow the gazelle, right? But in reality, there is no lion. No one will kill you. Do you know what the lion is in real life? PR. Articles. Interviews. When you do something different and interesting, the camera follows you. There is no lion. Literally, lion is fear that exists inside of your own head, and that's it. Let's go to Frank. Grant, uh, <clears throat> fantastic. This is, is an incredible uh, topic. I'm in the career management business, and in my world, uh, it, my business, it's an ocean of emotion. So this is a fantastic topic. I was wanting to know, do you have any, uh, any resources you might recommend in terms of books on the topic? Um, yeah, For which topic? Well, the I, neuroscience, the logic, emotion, decision-making. Here's, here's a good start, okay? So um, it's a lot easier and quite frankly, a lot more fun to learn about behavioral economics than it is to learn about neuroscience. Neuroscience is really, really hard to get through because basically neuroscience is written for other neuroscientists. Um, so read... Um, uh, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow. Thinking Fast and Slow is a really good one. That's Daniel Kahneman. Now, it's a bit of a read. You're going to be angry. Um, read uh, Pitch Anything. That pitch is anything? Pitch Anything. Um, it's a great, great book that you only have to read the first half of. Um, and that's, for, that's by a guy named Oren Klaff. K-L-A-F-F. -F. Um, you can read... Uh, 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 there's a few people that that really spearheaded the neural the the, uh, uh, the behavioral econ game early in the two, late '90s and early 2000s. Um, what am I rereading? Um, well, that'll keep me busy for a while. Yeah, it, email me and I'll, I'll I can if anybody's interested, I'll give you a list of books. Yeah, uh, thank you again. A terrific topic. Cool, thanks. Let's go to Tabitha. Hey guys, um, love your talk today. I'm really interested. I just wrapped up a couple of years um, working with Tractor Supply Company. And mm -hmm. one of the challenges that we had strategically was the customer experience measuring that. Mm -hmm. And it drove me nuts on the surveys because I felt like only certain people are like survey takers. Some people always take surveys. I'm one of those people that will never take a survey. Um, and it drives my car dealership nuts. But, you know, so can you talk about survey bias? Is that a mm -hmm. thing? And um, just say a little more about that. Excellent question. Um, is survey bias a thing? You bet your butt. Uh, but here's the thing. So is everything else. Have you guys ever taken a survey and it says, please rate your satisfaction, very satisfied, somewhat satisfied, neutral, somewhat dissatisfied, very dissatisfied. So here's something to keep in mind. Emotional neutrality, so the neutral option, is a physiological impossibility. It doesn't exist, even if you don't know that much about something. So let me give you an example. Okay, let's just pretend that I've never even heard of tractor supply, okay? Now, the first time I heard about it is when Tabitha just told me. So here's how the brain creates association and value. 
There is no internal metric for value or cost. That's why Rolex can charge $10,000 for a watch and someone can make one exactly the same and only charge a thousand. The brain has no internal metric on value at all. So, um, so my first, my first uh, uh, experience with Tractor Supply, now I know absolutely nothing about this organization, but I know the people that are in this call. I don't know Tab. Maybe I do know Tab. Tab, I know. I don't think I know Tabitha, right? So um, I don't know Tabitha, but I know Tabitha is in Randy's group, and I know Randy has a group of really smart people that are that are that are leaders. So I already have a biased opinion of Tabitha who worked there. So that means without any information at all, I have a bias towards tractor supply. So. Yes, it is a thing. The good news is, so is the rest of the world. So as far as survey takers and not survey takers, that's kind of a thing. But um, I have CEOs that tell me all the time, well, I don't take surveys. And I say, and so my response is, is very simple. Who's your, um, who's your most important vendor? Oh, it's XYZ. Who's the CEO? Uh, Steve. If Steve sent you an email and said, hey, we're trying to get better, right? And that's going to help you. It's going to help us. Could you take five minutes and do this? What's the chances of him taking it? Well, he's going to take it. Yeah, because it's real. A, a one that's not real is your car dealership or the one that you get from Home Depot. You know why it's not real? Because you have zero emotional connection to those and you don't care enough to take an action. But when it comes to finding, because uh, you have people that are ambassadors, right? They exist along the customer adoption uh, curve. They exist along all kinds of different things. But uh, people will take surveys and, and uh, uh, if you incentivize them and if you just ask them in a real way uh, and people are mo most of the time are very su surprised at the responses that, that they're able to get. There's ways so, to get to bias. Tabitha, that's an hour long conversation, but I'm happy to have you with you later though. Yeah, it sounds like relevance um, is really important just like it is in behavior change and then, um, you know, personal experience, that emotional connection. So thank you. Let's go to Mike Kenny. Grant, hey, fantastic talk. I, I knew it would be, so I'm super excited. But very briefly, one, I know with your surveys, they're exceedingly sophisticated measuring responses and all that stuff. And my level is very, very rudimentary, but I'll send out survey monkey stuff, et cetera. And there's two things. One, open-ended versus, you know, I'll say set answer questions. And I know you you alluded to this about, you know, people's biases. They're going to, you know, if, if you're leading with certain questions, there's inherent bias in that. But what I find is I try to reconcile one of two things. Open-ended questions are beneficial in that somebody can pour out their heart and soul to you and really unearth something that maybe you're not even cognizant of or aware of. But then the flip side of that is most of the ones that I've done, people offer very little. That's one. Number two, the fixed set answer questions, while there may be some inherent bias, oftentimes what I find is at least if you offer somebody something, you know, an easier choice, they may not even realize, and at least you're offering something that spurs in their minds, hey, that's a great point. I, I do like this about your product or whatever. So, you know, in, in some, do you have any insights into that? The, you know, Yeah, so what you're fundamentally battling is, is something that we fundamentally battled for a long time. And, and uh, there, there's, so I'll, t I'll tell you the answer and then I'll tell you why. So the answer is you should not be trying to innovate with Boolean question bases like multiple choice. And the reason for that is because um, you, it's very difficult to discern the value that exists between one thing or the other. You're also asking someone to answer something in a vacuum. We cannot replicate a moment where someone makes a purchase, it's impossible. So we don't try to. So instead what we do is we try to find out what's important to them. And if we can find out what's important to them, we can very easily reverse engineer that solution. So if I see a survey that has what you're talking about, I'm gonna throw that question out. And, and it's not because it's necessarily a bad question, it's because there's way better, uh, there, well, there's a better way to get there that has substantially better data. Now, 
uh, op as far as open-ended questions, open-ended questions are great. What we found is that we had to create a new way to analyze open-ended questions and we do it by concepting. And the reason is because if you get a whole bunch of open-ended responses, most of the time that what something will default to is like a word cloud. Well, word clouds lack context. And so, wow, you get to see the number of times a word pops up, but is it being sarcastic? So we actually have it manually done by people. Um, it's totally inefficient, and but it's the only way to actually do it correctly. Uh, keep in mind, uh, and I just wrote an article on this that no, that no, I don't know, I don't think anybody reads my articles, but uh, it's called uh, what the hell did I call it? Uh, the Henry Ford. So we 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 said uh, we solved the Henry Ford paradox, the innovation paradox. You know, the faster horses thing. Well, here's why. Because what Henry was referring to was that if I, a if I ask people to innovate for me, it's not going to work. And he's exactly right. So in a survey, if you ask someone to innovate for you, expect failure, expect a faster horse. So I gave a series. Of, so go read that article, Mike, because you'll, you'll I actually do have some things that you can do in there that will help you make sure that you aren't asking biased questions like, like, cause what you're doing is you're sitting around and you're going, well, how could we do this better? And you're coming up with like five or six things and you're relying on them to go, hmm, oh, okay, whatever. But that doesn't, so, but, but that's all we know. Our, our skill of relativity is a couple of Boolean responses. I'm going to be real friggin' nervous doing a rollout recommendation based on the frequencies that exist inside of the scope of those answers, even with a statistically relevant sample. It's an absolutely great little more advanced type of question, but read that article. It's on our website somewhere in our insight section. And, and, and it'll, it, I address some of that. Well, let's go to Lisa. So Grant, um, in kind of along those lines and you know, trying to identify why people buy from us, are there really some key um, questions or maybe uh, general questions that we can ask to pull that emotional piece out of someone? Um, so uh, here, so here's how we do it. We, we sit down, we write down all of our value props, right? Value props inherently contain emotion. Suck the creative language out of it because you're confusing the brain and boil it down to very simple and objective principles. And then we essentially have people react to those. And then we measure the reaction and then it runs through our filter and it gives us, it gives us a number and we say, hey, look, this is, this is a raw motive score and it's, this is the number and, and there's, a, there's, a 10, there's a 10 point drop between this idea and this idea, which means if you run with this idea all day long, the statistics say you're gonna win more often. Sucking emotion out of someone is extremely challenging to do in a survey. Like it was basically, when we started, we couldn't even identify a way to do it. We had to go back and look at qualitative methods, which essentially the world of qual and quant always exist here and there's a huge gray area in between them. All we did was build a system that allowed us to kind of steal from both to create something that was new and a little bit more actionable. Because typically what happens is you, you'll go and do and you'll do the qual and you'll get interviews and you'll get ideas and you'll get um, uh, you'll get emotions that come out and you'll be like, oh, maybe we should think about it this way. And then you go back to the quant, which is typically a different person that's executing that. And then you got to try and find common ground, which is really, really tough because emotion exists in the qual side because it's people. Quant is more behavior and it's, it's, really, it's really challenging to do. Uh, if you were asking me to give you an example of a question that you could ask that could get to emotion, I'm going to default to like Mike said, which is an open-ended response. That's your best case scenario to get qual at some kind of a, um, at some kind of scale. Um, but asking a question, um, NPS, find out what they're, I don't like NPS. I think it's a worthless metric, but everybody likes it uh, because the reason it works is because it, it attributes a number to something that's wildly complicated. And that means you can track it. But as far as being able to use that information to improve, so for instance, let's say that your NPS is a, is, is a 7.4 and maybe it used to be a 7.2 and you guys are high-fiving. 
So a leader who's trying to figure out why would say, all right, how do we get to a 7.6? Or in Carrie's case, how do we get it to 11.5? And, and you got to, so now, what, what, what did we do between the, between the, the 7.2 and 7.4? Do we change that? Do we not change that? It's where you get really tricky. Um, all that to say, Lisa, I don't have a good answer for you. Okay. And, and I probably should have said, like, I, I'm thinking like more in person when you're actually talking with hmm. somebody. So you're there to interact with them. Ask why four times. I mean, don't sound like a record, but you know what I mean. Use your intuition. Ask ask why four times. Okay, thank you. The more um, flowery, the more flowery their response, the less the less accurate it is. If they give you a couple of words, you're getting close. Because I hate my mom. Now you know. Because I don't like going there. Okay, why don't you like going there? The people are mean. Now we know four times. Okay. Thank you for that. Yeah, Harry had to drop off, but I think folks who know Harry know there's a deep meaning behind and a, and a deep purpose behind his involvement in Head for the Cure. You've got Mike on here with a charitable organization. You got Jen on here. Joe is on here with the church. Because it's human behavior oriented, have you found these same methods work for understanding why people engage with a charity or why people attend a church or why people are involved okay. in a certain philanthropic organization. Yeah, that's why we brought Katie on. Um, she, I think she has a meeting, but that's why we brought her on because we found, like, I didn't know anything about nonprofits. I worked in the business world and we had nonprofits that were hiring us and I was, you know, I knew what I knew. And um, we were like, holy crap, there's a lot of these nonprofits that need help. Actually, our scores are higher and they need help. So first of all, they do the work that most of us won't. Um, and, and some of that work is incredibly important. Things that would go by the wayside, keeping arts organizations open, um, helping people that we don't, we, we don't simply have the desire or stomach or genetic disposition to help. And they, they, need, they need to be helped. And, and one of the things I really like doing, by the way, when we work with nonprofits is help them understand you provide value among begging for money. What kind of thing can you do that will actually allow you to create a capital model where you can charge and you can provide value and that way you don't have to ask all the time for money. You can, you can, you can maybe even just support some of your operational costs by, um, uh, uh, by doing what you're doing in a different capacity for the open market the best nonprofits that I've seen. So a great example, I think is Alpha Point, if you guys know Alpha Point, led by a really, really smart um, uh, uh, CEO, Reinhardt Mabry. Reinhardt was basically charged with, you have to go convince blind people or you have to go convince um, businesses to hire blind people. And he basically was like, I got a better chance of teaching them to walk backwards, that ain't gonna work. So what he did is he started businesses that blind people could thrive at because they're highly tactile, call centers and things like that. And now they're like a $75 million organization that, and they, they don't rely on donations at all. Totally flip the script on a nonprofit. And he doesn't get any special treatment either just because he has blind people that he has, uh, I think it's just under the majority of, uh, it's pretty close. I think it's just under 50% of, of his staff is blind. That, that is the future of nonprofits. So that's one of the things we, we, at least me personally, part of my mission when we look at nonprofits, help them figure out how can you make money so you don't have to beg for it? Because that, that ain't going to work. The number of profits uh, tripled in the last like five years and the number, and the, and the number of and the do donations per capita fell. So there's a reckoning coming and those who figure out how to make money without having to ask for it are going to be the ones that survive. I think Frank's going to close us out with one last question. So, uh, Grant, um, I found that the surveys that I send out uh, are um, the impact of the information that I'm um, that I'm given has a is, is has a great deal to do with the relationship level that I have with the person I'm sending the survey to. I'd like your comments on that. Yeah, that's the easy answer, right? Okay. Um, I trust so and so. You got to get past that layer. 
there's something else. I assure you, it, it's always there. Um, we have, uh, in the event a client can convince us to test relationship, we try to talk them out of it because we already know it's not going to be a thing. Um, it's a cop out answer that's really, really easy. Re okay, the brain is one of the laziest things, uh, uh, maybe the laziest organ in our entire body. It is like water trying to find the least path of resistance. And that is true in almost everything we try to do. We, our brain's always trying to find the easy way out. And if I can say, Frank, it's because you're amazing. Ah, come on, dude, I trust you. I've known you for 10 years. You're not gonna say anything else. You're not gonna go, well, what do you trust about me? Because that's a weird social conversation and your mammalian brain is not gonna let that happen. Well, so it's a, cop, it's a cop out answer like price. Yeah, well, what uh, what I'm referring to is not so much the fact that they love me. I know that already, but they have a tendency to be more candid with me about how I might do things differently. Um, example, I'll go to Randy and Harry and William here on the call many times and say, hey, guys, this is what I'm thinking or to get their opinion. And some, when I send out surveys to people like that, I usually get, I've just learned something and they're usually candid with me because they care about me. Is that fair? They're, you're saying that they're, you're saying that you, when you do a survey, you're learning something? Correct. Right. And, well, and when I say good, that you should, that's the point. You're supposed to be. Yeah. Right. That do like me. I, they're usually more honest with me. Um, oh, via survey than they are to your face. Correct. Yeah, that's well, right. No, they're, they're honest with me in, to, to my face as well. But I found that the, the surveys, I'm not so much after, do they like me, but they'll be more constructive in terms of, I don't know, criticism or they mm -hmm. want to help me get better, right? Mm -hmm. If I want compliments, I'll call my mother, right? Mm -hmm. So that's usually what I'm after when it comes to surveys. Does that make sense or? Yeah, so uh, they will. So you will get constructive credit. They'll, they'll, be, they'll be more honest with you on paper than they will to your face because we don't have to, that, that way, because I don't have to read your facial expressions. And a lot of times when you get really candid feedback from somebody, you'll notice they look down. Um, and it's because they don't want to look at your face, especially if they're being if they're being constructive or have some type of a criticism. It's way, way easier to do it on paper. Kind of like when you're really pissed off, you write a note and then you throw it away. Same type of thing. Right. You're super <laughs> honest in the note. And you're like, oh, my God, I would never say that to somebody. Right. Exact same type of scenario. So they will be more honest with you. But I want to challenge you to do two things. Right. I never want to go towards negativity. Very, very. I mean, it's there's some times where it makes sense, but uh, we can we can identify fear, which is the most powerful emotion. And if we can, fear has driven human beings to do despicable and unbelievable things uh, in, in our history. And uh, you can use fear to make sales. It, it does work. Uh, it's not very ethical, in my opinion. So I would challenge you, instead of saying, what can I do better? Just try and figure out what's important to them. And then you can arrive at what's better. Yeah. It's very... Great. It's instead of induction, instead of going, who are you going to vote for? And then rely on their answer, say, what issues are important to you? At the end of the conversation, you can infer who they're going to vote for without having to ask them. That's great. Thank you, Grant. If you got time, well, let's sneak one more back in on David. I think he wants to build on the nonprofit as a business uh, theme here, David. Yeah, thanks, Randy. Hey, Grant. I volunteer and I'm on the board at Reconciliation Services. And one of the things that we're doing is we're setting up a for-profit subsidiary to help fund that. And again, I absolutely agree with that. I think that the, eight, the day of, of you know, whether it's um, putting on some kind of gala, those type of things, I, I think that donor Donor fatigue is a real thing. And there's always some, like you said, there's so many other, there's so many opportunities for people to do that. So, you know, we're committed to, to uh, helping, the, helping the poor, um, you know, primarily in, in, the, uh, in the area of uh, truce. But we're like, okay, so one of the ways we're going to do that is we're going to start a third party logistics company. So I, I just, you know, I, I've seen others that have been successful doing that. And I, I think you're, you're, you're spot on. And I think people are, are more willing in some cases to, 
to to work with a a uh, an endeavor like that than they would be just to to open up a checkbook. So they you know, they they would be very willing to say, hey, you guys are supporting a great cause by what you're doing. The money you're raising is providing trauma services and other services to people in the community. Uh, I'm absolutely going to do business and become a customer. Well, what we have to, what we have to just remember and keep in mind that people are pretty damn different, and there's nothing we can do about that. Uh, some people, so for instance. Uh, uh, if, if, if someone says, hey, we have to grow reconciliation services, but now we, we've added a layer of complexity, which is this new uh, for-profit subsidiary that's going to do logistics, right? Which I imagine was a system that was stolen from the current, the current logistics model with the nonprofit. And you could say, uh, some, and you could say well, the point is to, it's to build this new revenue stream. We have to stop asking for money. Some people, I would be one of those people, but an in value of one would say, hell yes. The more sustainability that you can build financially around an organization, the less, the more sustainable you are. And the more I know that I'm not dumping money into an organization that's going to fail because they can't convince other people to give money like me. So some people will be like, oh my God, you're for profit. Like that's, that feels icky, right? The whole reason I'm doing business or the, the, I'm donating is because I'm helping something and they may be complete. So who are those people? What do they look like? So that's where segmentation comes into play, which is a massively important part of not only managing your business, but doing research. Who are those segments? What are their commonalities? How can we repeat them? We can understand them at an individual level or as an aggregate. And now you can make sure you're saying the right thing to the right people so that you don't get that icky kind of response. No, that's that's very helpful. And that's that's the challenge is we still, you know, st still do pursue uh, both corporate and individual donations but with this other element, we're, that's, a, that's a challenge we're facing as a board is, is how to try to segment the uh, uh, donor base or customer base. Here's a, here's a great, very quick story. There's a, a, a billionaire funded a uh, cancer center up north in Michigan. And he had us come in and uh, his thing was, how are we supposed to get people to give money to one of the richest families in the country. Totally great, Bernie, like totally like reasonable question. And, and they, were, they were a little bit gun shy because they had a $1.4 billion endowment that funded the operations almost into perpetuity, just based on the interest alone would fund the operations. And, uh, and they were like, oh my gosh, we have so much money and stuff and people aren't gonna do. So the analysis we did, the number one most mo mostly resonant concept was that uh, with the manifestation of that idea was not that we don't have to pay for operations or was not that they, we don't have to fund operations. It's 100% of every dollar I give goes to fight cancer. And that resonated off the charts. And when and, uh, their agency, which is a very large agency, uh, decided to forego that message and went with a different one. And it was a massive failure and they were fired. But the, uh, uh, that was the, the, the test markets that they used that, like one test market they did where they used that and just a couple of billboards, uh, donations went up 80% in three months. So it was, it's like use the right emotive manifestation of the idea and you're gonna win, period. Thank you. Grant, this was awesome. I wish we had eight more hours because I didn't even get to my questions because there were so many other great questions. So oh, my uh, bad. I you you got to cut me back. off. I, if I talk too much before you got to cut me off. That's what Courtney does. She doesn't. Oh, is that right? Okay. Uh, we're, we're just going to have to have you back for more questions because this was uh, incredible. Awesome insights, Grant. Well, thanks for letting me hang out, guys. It's, it's, uh, it's intimidating being on this side of the... Uh, of the um of the rest of the crew <laughs> you did great and you uh stirred a lot of thoughts today so uh great job i appreciate it i think everybody here appreciated it cool well it's good to see everybody thanks for having me on randy yeah. the best everyone have a great weekend and we'll see you again next week see y'all bye